Hello. Welcome back. Um, this year for a paper review, since you already have a couple out of paper one and a couple of paper two, um, but for paper one, this is better late than never. I apologize, but your girl's been busy. But I, this year, put all the extended response questions separated by chapters. I compiled all the extended response questions. So these are the questions that are the big marks that are in area B of the exam. So the back of the exam. Um, I've been recommending to my students this year, start in the back, which probably is common knowledge, but I, this is three, one, um, but I, I don't, yeah, whatever, you know, sometimes we have good ideas. So starting in the back and definitely flipping over your test to make sure you see if there's any question on the very back. Sometimes they sneak one in. The only extended response question that I did not include is from October, November retake of this past year, number six, and it had the picture of water in its solid, liquid, and gas phase. And you had to talk about the strengths and the limits. And I hate that question with the passion of a thousand suns. I don't like it. I'm not gonna do it. I think it's a really poor representation of the syllabus. And as students, you guys typically don't have the opportunity to say like, oh, that diagram actually is not helpful. Um, <clears throat> I have a million things I can say about it. I don't like it. I'm not going to waste my time on it again. I've done it one time with my students, regretted it, regret it still, don't like it. So otherwise, since the new syllabus came out in 2022, this is every extended response question broken down by chapter. Um, I'm going to post a link or I'm I have a link posted in the description of this video and it is so you also have access to this document and I recommend you print it out not to get scientific or anything like that but studies do show that the best type of studying and revision is by doing practice exam papers no matter what you're studying for um, all right, let's let's get to it. So this first question is different. It has not really been featured in the syllabus at all, where you just have to talk about the carbon atom or an atom in general. So it's relatively simple. Um, six marks. Highlight your brackets, not necessarily the questions. I would highlight questions, but definitely identify it with your brackets first, because some questions, shorter response questions, do not have some lines with them. Sometimes they just tell you to do something. And so if you identify it through the marks, then you're sure not to, not to miss it. All right. So things we can identify, like where do you start? Cause we've never had a question like this before. Um, first of all, you have shells or orbitals. There's two of them. And within the shells or orbitals, you have electrons four in the outer shell, two in the inner shell, which is all the inner shell can hold. Total of six electrons. On the inside, carbon is atomic number six. And you can tell because they're, you know, the, between the different colors inside the nucleus, no matter what you decide is gonna be a neutron, what is gonna be a proton, it doesn't matter from inside the nucleus, they have the same amount of each. So um, I'll term the dark ones as being the protons, but regardless, no matter what, if you know you have six electrons, that tells you you're also going to have six protons. So if you have six negative things, you're going to have six positive things. Six protons, and then the remaining one is going to be your neutrons, and you do have six of those. Six neutrons. All right, and the command word is describe. So what, what is the structure of the carbon atom shown? Okay, so start with just in generalities, we have six protons and six electrons and six neutrons. So typically when it says this, um, you don't have to write it exactly like this when the mark scheme says to have that and it says the word and. You don't have to have exactly like this. You also could throughout here, throughout your answer, um, have those things included, but you would need to have all three included. Okay, so starting, we can start with the outer shell with your electrons. We have six electrons. I'm um, sorry. Yes, there's six electrons, but um, electrons have... 
a negative charge. And I'm just gonna abbreviate a lot of things, but when we take this exam, we are not abbreviating. We're not using money signs like this. There's no dollar signs because this is an international exam and not everybody uses the dollar. So we can put income or we can put money, but we're not gonna write the money sign. I'm also gonna use a lot of arrows um, just for shorthand stuff. And that is also something we're not gonna do tomorrow or anytime we take paper one. Electrons have little to no mass. Little to mass, little to no. There's two electrons in the inner shell. Four electrons in the outer shell. That's good for our electrons. Okay, and we, actually, it, this is not its own mark. These things need to be said together. Um, for our nucleus, protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, and it has to be the word nucleus. It's underlined, so you can't say, like, in the center. It needs to be the nucleus. <sighs> protons have a positive charge. Neutrons have no charge. And their mass, protons and neutrons, both have a mass of one. And that's how carbon can get its atomic mass of 12. Typically it looks something like this, carbon, six for the amount of protons and then down here would say like 12. And one more thing you can say is about its overall charge as an atom. It doesn't have a charge and that's because the amount of protons is equal. I didn't mean to say that, that is equal, not, not equal. Equal to the electrons. Or in other words, you can say that there's no overall charge on the atom. Straight off the periodic table, these things are atoms. They are not ions. It's not an ion unless it gives or takes an electron. These are your protons and your neutrons. Um, I get a lot of questions and just follow-up feedback about can um, you use bullet points? So I just always bullet point for my students. That way they know where the new mark is, where the different marking points are. It's, it's easy. And the only, you know, if you read any of the examiner reports after the exams have been marked and graded, there's a lot of feedback on them. You'll go wrong with using bullet points if you don't add like a descriptive statement in the beginning, especially when it's an explain question. If it's an explain question, you need to give some sort of indication that the mark you're writing about is the explanation for something else, or it's a reason for something else. And so you'll see me do that throughout. I'll still put it in a bullet point, but perhaps it's like a describe and explain, I write the description and then the explanation is below it, but I'll say something like this causes, this is caused by, this results in. So something that is indicating to the examiner that you are giving rationale for why you're writing this statement essentially. All right, love this question actually. There's been a variety of this question, but this is a different figure for it. Describe the bonds within and between the molecules shown and this is a water molecule. We need to talk about the bonds within the water molecule and between water molecules. Six marks, this should be an easy one to do. And we should isolate the different water molecules so you can at least see what you're looking at. So here's one, here's one, here's one. There you go. And 
the bonds they're talking about are right here that are between molecules. All right. Water is made of oh, great from covalent bonds, which means they share electrons. That's not an H, don't do that. This is our oxygen, here's our hydrogens. And from the syllabus learning outcome in the first section, um, you need to be able to make sure you can show or draw how a water molecule is and how the, specifically how the electrons are shared. So I'll do the shared electrons in red. Hydrogen comes to the party with one electron only. It is atomic number one. We got one to share. Hydrogen would require one more so that its only shell, its inner shell and its outer shell, its only shell, it's the first orbital, it can only hold two electrons. Make sure you don't say the octet rule for hydrogen or for water in general because hydrogen does not follow the octet rule of eight. does not. So hydrogen just has one to have, and then oxygen has six electrons, and it does require two more to have a full outer shell. And in this drawing, I'm not drawing its inner shell, I'm drawing its most outermost shell. It does require two more so we can have eight. And goodness gracious, that's one, two, three, don't come for me about how I draw this, four, five and six and then oxygen seven and eight is going to come from sharing with hydrogen seven and eight hydrogen gets its outer shell satisfied by sh getting a shared electron from oxygen so now hydrogen will have two that orbits around it each one and oxygen will have eight orbiting around it um that makes it stable but Typically, we don't want to just say that in our answers because that sounds vague. Like, what does it mean to be stable? It's stable, which means that it has full outer shells. All of the shells are full. The last thing about this is they share. So they're not ions, but they don't share equally. Oxygen has more electron affinity. It has more electrons around it. It can attract more electrons. So if it has more electrons and those are negative, Oxygen has more negativity, but they do not give and take. They share. It's just not equal. And for that, we would say oxygen has a partial negative charge. And hydrogen, comparatively, because it does not have that same amount of electrons around it, comparatively will have a partial positive charge. And they show you this in this image. There's your partials. And if we notice anything, we can notice that this partially negative oxygen atom of one water molecule is attracted to the partially positive hydrogen atom of another water molecule. And you see it happening multiple places. Water has so many, so many hydrogen bonds in just one drop. Hydrogen bonds um, are easily broken but there are so many of them and they're easily broken with heat, but there are so many of them. So they can store a lot of heat and that is what gives water its high heat capacity and allows it to help like maintain stable or more mild climate temperatures. You don't have such, um, not climate temperatures, that sounds redundant, but climates or like overall temperatures if you live near the coast. You don't have massive temperature fluctuations because of all the water vapor in the air. All right, so if we're describing the bonds that make it and then between it, we can start with within, the bonds within. And on any of these questions, if it's easier for you to do a T-chart, do a T-chart. Or you can do labels like this, and it's easier for the grader to at least know what you're talking about, and it's visually easier to see. So the bonds between hydrogen and oxygen atoms, they're not ions, they are atoms, are covalent. Means they share, but they don't share equally. 
Okay, electrons are shared. The oxygen atom has six electrons in the outer shell. So we're just describing the sharing. It needs two more. It shares one electron with each hydrogen atom. Don't say molecule, don't say ion, it is an atom. It has not given or taken any electrons. <sighs> All right, and then our other one is gonna be the bonds between. I always tell my students to drawing pictures, having a label, that is so helpful. And if you can't put something into words, draw it out first. Draw out what it looks like and label it and annotate it, label your heart out. Those do get marked for sure. Okay, the hydrogen atom. So we need to talk about why there are these bonds between them. It's partially positive. The oxygen atom is partially negative. This is more of an explain, but still valid. This is because the oxygen atom attracts more electrons. All right, this is a wordy statement, but we're essentially going to be staying, saying that the partially positive hydrogen atom can attract or is attracted to the partially negative oxygen atom of another water molecule. All right, and it's not in the, this mark scheme, but I always think if it was right or it was valid and it was accepted last year or a couple years before that, it the science hasn't changed. And that's just my thought. So though it might not be in the mark scheme, it still could be positively marked. Something that my students have written a lot um, is that, like, the reason. And now, it doesn't say dis explain, but it also didn't say explain, and we were able to say this one here, oxygen atom attracts more electrons. So, that being said, I always have my students put the reason why there's this attraction to each other, and this is because electrostatic forces um, develop or form. The last mark, which is, I always think it's like the insult mark for, uh, insult mark for water, but it's that hydrogen bonds are weaker than covalent bonds. Like hydrogen bonds are weak. It's like, hey, you're weak. Like, I don't know. This just, it seems so random to me sometimes. For this question at least. There it is. Love this one. Okay, a few more and then we'll be on to chapter two and I'll do a separate video for that. So explain. Explain is give reasons for, so why or how. The effect, that is vague. The effect, we need to state what the effect is. We need to state what the effect is. Of increasing ocean temperature on the solubility or the ability for salts to get dissolved and gases. 
these are two completely separate effects. We cannot link them as one. All right, so increasing temperature on the solubility of salts. And this is another one I'm also gonna split up. You can do a T-chart. All right, and so here you'll see how I'm gonna use the bullets with an explain question. As the temperature increases, and again, we're not using arrows, not tomorrow, the solubility or ability to get dissolved of salts increases. So when you compare this to is like iced coffee or coffee at all. Well, comparing them. Um, coffee will dissolve sugar much faster when it's hot. When you get an iced coffee with sugar, a lot of times you have massive clumps of sugar at the bottom of the cup because that is just where it's going to go because it has mass and it's going to sink. It's more dense and you don't have the same amount of kinetic energy in the water in that, or the hot coffee to to start dissolving it. And we'll write about what's actually happening on a molecular level. So this is the effect right here. We had just, we said what the effect was. And then the explain. As the temperature increases, the kinetic energy, KE kinetic energy, Oh, sorry, the, I'm not gonna say causes yet. It's just kinetic energy increases. Okay, so relating temperature to kinetic energy, awesome. High kinetic energy. And if those arrows don't work for you, then just write it out like normal. It caused the molecules to move faster. Right, kinetic energy is energy in motion. And so literally, I'm gonna lead this with resulting in, so I'm continually leading to my next bullet or giving an explanation for why I'm writing that bullet from the previous. Resulting in more collisions between the water and the salt. And um, we can also add here that the bonds of the salt, the ionic bonds, break faster. All right, and so this was all my explains. Opposite, solubility of gases. F, F, all right. F means fail, obviously. Opposite here, hot things cannot hold gas well. That's why any of our dry shampoo or anything that's under pressure, hairspray, whatever, it all says um, keep away from heat, keep out of sunlight. There's a lot of warnings about them possibly exploding because you just cannot keep gases under pressure, keep gases in solution whenever it's warm. As temperature increases. Gas solubility decreases. All right, if you have not mentioned 
anything about temperature resulting high temperature resulting in high kinetic energy, this would be the time to do it, but you're not going to get the same marking point twice. So if you wrote it about salts, you do not need to write it again. And if you're like, how would I remember that? Then just write your heart out and write it twice, but you can only get it once. Yes, one second. High kinetic energy in water. causes gases to diffuse out of solution or out of the out of the ocean water out of the sea water it's diffusion not dissolve it's diffusion because gases are in a gaseous state and if it's coming out of the water it's going into the atmosphere which is already a gaseous state so a gas going to a gas is diffusion if it's a gas getting into a liquid, it would be dissolution, dissolving. Um, you can, sorry, you can say the word faster. Or at a higher rate or faster. So the higher the temperature, the higher kinetic energy. And in class, like I compared this to, you know, colder water, maybe moving almost like, like a slow dance. And then when water gets really hot, it's more like a mosh pit and there's a lot of collisions. Got it, got it. Yes, okay. Two more. Okay, this question is a uh, Cambridge favorite. Describe how, so this is a cute way of saying describe and explain because you got the house you need to give reasons for describe how temperature and salinity gradients they're talking about differences so what's going on at the surface below the surface and towards the seabed form in seawater and how mixing of these layers will occur now mixing doesn't matter if it's because it's mixing the temperature or it's mixing salts it literally does not matter if water is mixing water is mixing okay i never would draw that or i never would even write about this without drawing it first um this is depth in meters this is the seabed and we got the surface up here All right, and if I'm doing temperature, degrees Celsius, we'll throw it up 28 there and a zero. We're warm at the surface because we have a lot of heat energy from the sun or thermal energy from the sun, but it doesn't penetrate really past the epipelagic layer. So then we will lose temperature really, really fast. That's our thermocline. And once we've lost a significant amount of the heat because it's not gaining it from the sun anymore, we have a slow decrease towards the seabed and we can never touch this axis right here because that means that water is at zero degrees Celsius in which it freezes in frozen water, water in a solid state will float because there's less water molecules in that same amount of volume. There's less water molecules, it literally means there's less mass, there's less water stuff. And if the mass is lower, then the density will be lower, hence it floating. This area is the thermocline layer. So this layer right here is what's gonna cause this really big density gradient. It is the reason why we have phytoplankton able to stay floating towards the surface and in the upper sunlit layers, layers of water. They don't have arms, tails, or legs, so they cannot swim if they get you know, below the thermocline or they start to sink, they can't swim out of it. So keeping water that is low in density at the surface because it is warm, super duper, it makes it great, makes it lovely, very helpful, very great. All the things. Okay, like I said, I wouldn't bother even doing this without this picture. And so it, these layers, we have what's going on at the surface. I usually would number that one. Below the surface, going on at area two, and towards the seabed is going on at area three. 
and we can start this at the surface. Um, sorry, temperature is high due to thermal energy, NRG, energy, NRG from the sun. And we're not writing energy tomorrow either. All right, and then like how, right? This is like the explain part, the how. Warmer water is less, de less dense Colder water and it floats. Below the surface, and here we're gonna do our thermocline definition essentially. The temperature decreases rapidly or the most, or the most drastically, however. Okay, and this is the thermocline. Okay, and then outside of there, this is towards the seabed, thermal energy and penetrate below like 150 meters, 200, 150, 200. The temperature decreases as the depth increases, not the other way around. Can't say the depth does anything, like the depth changes because of temperature. No, the change in temperature does not cause the oceans to be more deep or shallow it's depth that is causing these issues because of its depth the sun is not going to have such a strong effect in deeper waters if we didn't already do a density comparative statement like we did in the second mark wa warmer water is less dense than colder water then it would be applicable for you to give a reason of why colder water is towards the seabed and it's not because it's deeper and it's not because well there's no sun there that's the reason why it's cold, but for its location, why is it at the seabed? That's all about density. Cold things will sink, warm things will float. Likewise, why is warmer water at the surface? It's not because of the sun. It's warm because it's the sun, but why is it at the surface? Beautiful. That is because warmer water floats. They don't get a choice to be like, I want to go to the sun. Let me be in the sun. It's not, they, not that you don't get a choice. They're, ju they're there because of physics and density. All right. Um, likewise, we can do the same thing for salinity, and we need to talk about mixing. All right. Again, we got the surface water. If it helps you to draw some waves to kind of get you in, get your brain right, cool. We measure salinity in parts per thousand with the salinometer, salinometer, salinometer. Average is 35, and so I usually put over here like 37, and over here we'll do like a 33. Again, depth in meters. We got the seabed at the bottom. Um, we should typically consider a temperate ocean. So an ocean that has some seasons in it. You don't want to put yourself in some kind of like tropical or Arctic anomaly unless they want you, polar anomaly, anomaly, sorry, unless they tell you to do it. But typically at the surface, salinity is going to be low and regardless of the season, this is why I say think temperate, you're going to have a form of precipitation, whether it's rain, snow, sleet, hail. And sure, there's evaporation, but in temperate locations, there's only evaporation during the summer, like it's excessive evaporation, excessive evaporation. While in you know any season, you're going to have precipitation. So our... Halo Klein will look like this. We're low at the surface, but 
rain does not go that far. It's not that deep. So it's going to be low just for a moment. And then we have a massive increase in salinity. And then we will, with depth, and then we will slowly sink towards the seabed. Um, notice this halo climb line is not straight across. Ugh, that doesn't make sense. Can't do that. It does have a decline with depth. And so this area here contributes to your overall pick no climb. Same with temperature. Pick, pick no is the density gradient. And so this layer of water maintains the salinity differences. It keeps low salinity diluted water at the surface because it's less dense and higher salinity water towards the seabed. They're typically in relatively similar areas, the thermocline and the halocline, and they will form the pycnocline, which is your the density differences. Okay, now you look at this as section one, section two, and towards the seabed is section three. At the surface. Sal salinity is low. Due to dilution. from the precipitation. Low salinity. Water is less dense and it flows, right? So that is the, why is it at the surface? Because it rains. No, water isn't like, I wanna be where it rains. It's not what happens. It's not, <laughs> it has low salinity because it's raining, but why does it stay at the surface is all a density solution, a density answer. Okay, below that. Below the surface. Something increases rapidly with depth. This is the halo line. And it's, it is increasing rapidly. It is not because we're adding salts. There's no way to actually add salts here. We're not putting in like a salt shaker and salting that halo cline. That is crazy. That is not why. I knew that would happen. I knew it would happen. It's not the reason why. Um, it's not about what's happening. It's about what's not happening anymore. And what's not happening anymore is the dilution from precipitation. Precipitation does not go that far in, in in past the surface. Like it's not going far in the ocean, so it's going to stay at the surface. So what you're seeing with this increase right here is not that there's any kind of addition of salts. That is in, in, unrealistic. It doesn't happen. It's that we don't have any more dilution. So it's kind of getting back towards its normal. Okay, we've again already made this density statement right here. So we don't need to say it again, but we will just say as depth increases, salinity continues to increase. It is more dense, it will sink. You could referencing like towards the seabed. Mixing. What is this? I'm sorry. Now is not the time. Now is not the time. Okay. I'm looking for like a little pose and note. I used to have little templates I can add. It's fine. Totally fine. I want to add mixing. I want to add mixing. I want to add mixing. Side note, um, if you're in this situation and you're taking a, uh, answering a question and you think you're running out of space or you realize you just wrote a bunch of garbage 
and you scratch it out and you don't want it, you can always say something because there's a lot of blank pages on these tests. You could always be like, um, answered on page five, right? And then the examiner looks at every single page, no matter what, and we'll go to page five. And then they're like, oh, look at this. And you're going to go page five and you're going to say, I'm answering like four AII or whatever the question is. And then they know that that's either a re response, like you're redoing it, or um, it's just you adding to a response. Um, gosh, where do I put mixing? Where do I put mixing? One moment. There is a, a little update here, and so adding a page is not as obvious. Curses. Okay, I'm, I'm literally just going to squeeze it over here. It'll be fine. <laughs> Mixing. All right, and it doesn't really matter, again, if it's temperature, if it's salinity, if it's trash or refuse, if it's plastics, if it's toxins, if it's eggs, if it's um, any sort of gametes, it's it's going to mix it. It doesn't matter. So we could have strong winds causing waves. What we don't want to say is winds as a mark and then waves as a mark. And you think that that's like a brilliant response. Because it is wind that is causing the waves. So they're not separate. They are together. Um, cooling of the surface. Um, this causes convection. Convection is that cold things sink and hot things rise. Like a lava lamp. Welling or thermo hailing circulation, like the global conveyor belt. All right, and our last question. The last question for chapter one from the extended responses, command word explain. So this is give reasons for why or how and how it's there. Biotic and abiotic factors affect, to me that's, that's vague. So they're affecting dissolved oxygen concentration. That's a number. Numbers can go up. Numbers can go down. So we'll need to talk about that. The dissolved oxygen concentration in the open ocean. Okay. Oops. Okay, biotic is living. So this is going to be photosynthesis, respiration, things like that. Abiotic, non-living. So temperature, salinity, some wave action, all that jazz. Um, we're going to teach art seven marks. Looking at the open ocean, a way that I considered this is it didn't say any specific area. Like, it didn't just say at the surface. It's, it could be the entirety of the open ocean. Um, think about how oxygen changes with depth. And I always draw some big waves there. 
And honestly, I draw like hungry waves. They're like eating the air. There you go. Some hungry waves, all right. Um, it's super saturated at the surface from photosynthesis and from wave action. And then we have a massive decrease because light penetration doesn't go that far. And waves do not affect, really, they, unless it's a massive storm, they really don't affect um, water for, far below the surface. But then we also have organisms here in the photic zone that are going to be constantly using up oxygen for respiration. So we end up with this depletion. We hit an oxygen minimum layer about a thousand meters down. And then we have a slow increase at the bottom and that's because we have low temperature and really high pressure. Okay, so we essentially need to identify why is it really high at the surface? Why do we have this rapid decrease? And then why does it move back up again? And for what reasons would they be biotic or abiotic? Your biotic components at the surface is really gonna dominate. So I would just like say this is our surface. Light penetration is high. Causing oxygen to be released in photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is done by living fact, um, by things that are alive, your producers, so that is biotic. Oxygen can go down from respiration. Explanation, the respiration is high due to, so there's my like linking phrase there, high populations of organisms, I'll write it all out, and you have high organism population there because there's high food availability also warmer temperatures so it's a suitable environment okay and then when we're at the like the oxygen minimum layers so this area around a thousand meters there's no light energy or light penetration. So no oxygen is being produced. However, you're losing oxygen. Why would we be losing oxygen? So we're saying we're not adding more, okay, but why is it going down? If, that's, if we're not adding more, then we would expect it to stay the same, but it doesn't. There is this rapid decrease right here. And it's going down because the oxygen is rapidly used up in respiration from the organisms that are still there. So maybe they're not all right in the upper sunlit layers of water because that's where your producers are going to hang out. There's There is going to be organisms kind of below that area a bit too. Um, you know, I mentioned in class like here it's like you know you have a job and you're making some money and then you quit your job well why don't we expect the money to say the same sure we're not adding to it so we're not getting more but it's going down so what would cause it to go down like you're spending it that's why we have this decrease and in biotic terms is it getting spent from using it in respiration 
So at the seabed, there's nothing that is really biotic at all that's going to be causing it to go up or go down. Is the oxygen minimum layer? Biotic, we have a lot more. So again, the surface, oxygen is high due to dissolution of atmospheric gases. wave turbulence okay this might seem like a duplicate mark and it certainly does seem like it's a duplicate mark um but whatever we're gonna write it anyways so in and of itself light penetration itself without considering the producer necessarily but light penetration is something that is abiotic photosynthesis is biotic but light penetration is, is abiotic. We can mention that. High light intensity causes more oxygen to be released. However, Something that else is abiotic is temperature. The surface has, surface has higher temperatures. So that can cause your oxygen concentration to be lower. So in the question didn't say like, how does it cause it to be high? How does it cause it to be low? It just says, how can it affect it? Additionally, air pressure is a factor. Um, off on the side, I'll put here, so this is from 1.2, the very end of 1.2. Things that can affect your gas solubility. Salinity. Water pressure. Atmospheric pressure. And temperature. Okay, back to it. Um, surface also is going to have um, lower atmospheric pressure, like during storms though. Storms, bad weather is low pressure. It's a low pressure system. When it's a nice day, the air pressure is considered to be higher. When air pressure is low... Um, oxygen solubility is lower or the concentration or the solubility to be lower. Like you just don't have, I don't want that. You don't have the same amount of pressure from the atmosphere pushing down on top of your water. You just don't have the same amount, so gases can start to come out of solution. Mm -hmm. Okay. At the surface, it can also rain. Precipitation, precip. I'm not even going to say at the surface because that's so obvious. <laughs> Precipitation can decrease the salinity. And increase the oxygen solubility. You could also say the reverse argument. O-R-A. Or the reverse argument. You don't need to say them both. Okay. And then really nothing for the oxygen minimum layer. That's all because it's being used up in respiration. But towards the seabed, um, we have high oxygen. And why is the oxygen high? It's um, This is all for abiotic reasons low temperature and high water pressure. Toward the seabed, oxygen increases from lower temps 
another mark, and high water pressure. Yay! So far, for almost all of these, we've been able to look at a picture. We started with a picture. And that's the last one of chapter one.